Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Firstly, I'd like to give a shout out and thanks to Glenn Fenwick of Sarnia, Ontario for his positive feedback and recommendation for the World of Warbirds Facebook page, where incidentally you can find images to accompany today's episode. All feedback is welcome. Today's episode is due to a request that came in from an iTunes review. Hey, for a five-star rating, I'll certainly honor your request. I'm sorry if you've been waiting a while for it, but I only just recently saw the actual review. There are certain warbirds that seem to carry the essence of the nation or regime that built them. One that comes to mind on the Allied side is definitely the B-17 Flying Fortress. It was built between the wars by the iconic manufacturer Boeing, with the theory of strategic daylight bombing baked right in. When you look at the B-17, it just screams American can-do brashness. In our vast factories, we will build these machines in great numbers, like toasters, and fly over our enemies and shoot our way in and out like gunslingers in our motion pictures. But today's episode is not on the B-17. It's on the Henkel HE-111. However, just like the B-17, the HE-111 carries the history, the aviation philosophy, and wartime strategy of the Third Reich soaked right into her spars and rivets. Let's get into it. Design and Development Part of the HE-111's genetic makeup is that it was conceived when Germany was not actually allowed to have an air force at all. Following the First World War, Article 198 of the Treaty of Versailles specifically prohibited Germany from having an air force. However, during the 30s, German rearmament had begun, but things had to be kept on the down low, if you know what I mean. Shh. Dr. Ernst Heinkel had already been seriously skirting the Treaty of Versailles for years. He had been born on the 24th of January, 1888, and was bitten by the aviation bug pretty early, first by zeppelins and then later by aircraft. He studied at the Technical Academy of Stuttgart and built and crashed his first airplane in 1911. Even the severe injuries that he suffered due to the accident didn't dissuade him from wanting to build more. He worked at several German aviation companies during the First World War, and after that conflict, in 1922, he opened his own company, the Heinkel Flugzeugwerk Company, based in Warnemunde, a part of the city of Rostock on the Baltic. Because of the Treaty of Versailles, Henkel had to start being tricky with his manufacturing from the very start. He worked with foreign governments, building seaplanes and seaplane catapult systems. He worked closely with the Japanese, building seaplanes that could be catapult-launched for the Imperial Japanese Navy. Actually, they started working so closely together that Japan, which was a member of the Treaty of Versailles Inspection Committee, started tipping Henkel off when the Allies were going to inspect his factories for treaty violations. Henkel was very thankful for these notices, and he would have the offending airplanes pushed out of the factory and hid in the dunes nearby until those pesky inspectors left. The predecessor to the 111 was the Henkel 70. This was a single-engined mail and passenger plane built for Deutsche Lufthansa in the early 1930s. I'll put a picture on the Facebook page. Dr. Henkel had a need for speed, and also this mail plane was in competition with an American model, the Lockheed Model 9 Orion, which could do a blistering, for the time, 220 miles per hour. Henkel insisted on many drag-reducing measures to make the 70 fast. It was a low-wing cantilever monoplane with retractable undercarriage, flush rivets, and the kind of aerodynamically efficient elliptical wing that we are used to seeing on the Spitfire. In fact, there's been some bickering over the years whether one company copied it from the other. However, there's never been a verdict one way or the other. It had a single 630 horsepower BMW 6 liquid-cooled V12 engine. By using an ethylene glycol mix rather than just water, it was possible to use a smaller radiator, which reduced drag even further. 
Supposedly the rad was able to be retracted at high speed, but I haven't seen any indication on how this worked. The pilot and radio operator sat in tandem, and back in the cabin, the four passengers sat in pairs facing each other. The 70 was able to achieve a maximum speed of 234 miles per hour, 14 miles per hour faster than the Lockheed, and set eight world records for speed over distance. It was so speedy that they called it the Blitz or Lightning. That was back in the days before that word had a warlike connotation. In 1933, Albert Kesselring was head of the Luftwaffe administration office. Although Germany had no Luftwaffe to administer per se, Kesselring met with Henkel that year in order to start to change that. He asked Henkel to build a twin-engine aircraft that could compete with the Boeing 247 and Douglas DC-2, which were the new generation of more modern airliners. Although the new Heinkel twin engine was outwardly to be an airliner, you know, the whole Treaty of Versailles thing, let's make it so that it could be quickly adapted to transport or bomber work. Wink, wink, shh. Heinkel set his aircraft designing Wonder Twins on the project. Oh yeah, I haven't mentioned them yet. Siegfried and Walter Gunther were both born on the 8th of December, 1899, and by the age of 16, they were already both heavily interested in airplanes, and especially propellers. They both served in the German army during World War I, and both were captured by the British army. Keeping the twins thing going, they both applied to, and were accepted into, the Institute of Technology Hanover, focusing their studies on aerodynamics and aircraft design. They both got jobs at Baumer Aero in Berlin and started designing sport planes and motor gliders. It was there that they first used the elliptical wing to reduce the effects of wingtip vortices and the drag that results from them. In 1931, Siegfried finally did something on his own and joined the Heinkel Flugzeugwerk company at Dr. Heinkel's urging. The solo thing wouldn't last long though, and about six months later, his brother joined him, and they started work on the 70 and other Henkel projects. Although Siegfried mainly designed the 70, Walter was responsible for the landing gear, which was the first ever retractable landing gear in a German-produced aircraft. It was their use of the elliptical wing, which reduced wingtip drag and made the 70 such a speedy aircraft. So it was pretty fitting when the twins were tasked with designing the new airplane that was initially called Doppelblitz, or Double Lightning. They stretched the fuselage and elliptical wings of the 70, removed the 600 horsepower BMW 6 engine from the nose, added a second engine, placing the engines on the wings. On 24 February 1935, Henkel chief test pilot Gerhard Nietzsche took off on the first test flight of the 111, and although he noted a few things that needed to be worked on, he was happy with the airplane's high speed and good-natured flight and landing characteristics. The aircraft was stable and behaved during single-engine flight, and he found no nose drop when the undercarriage was operated, which had been a worry. By the end of 1935, two new aircraft were built and given civilian registrations. Delta Alpha Lima Echo Sierra achieved fame as the, quotes, fastest passenger aircraft in the world, close quotes, when it flew at 250 miles per hour. In the end, 32 prototype aircraft were built, including 12 civilian airliners. However, 1935 was an important year in German aviation, which is when the Luftwaffe's existence was revealed and the open move to rearm began. The military version of the HE-111 first flew in 1936. The fuselage was lengthened by about 4 feet. A 7.92 mm MG-15 machine gun was installed in the nose, with a second on top of the fuselage and a third in the belly with a retractable dustbin type turret. The bomb bay had two compartments and could carry 1,500 pounds of bombs. There was a great deal of tinkering with variants up until the E model. Early models were badly underpowered with two 578 horsepower BMW 6 engines. However, upgrading to supercharged 850 horsepower DB600Cs 
with variable pitch propellers, gave the new bomber the power it sorely needed. As such, bomb capacity was also increased to 3,300 pounds. 1937 can be seen as a pivotal year in the history of the HE-111. It was in this year that Henkel began working on the E-model, which was the last pre-production version before operational use began. Some of these E's would actually go on to fight with the Condor Legion in Spain. It was also the last year of the amazing partnership of the Gunter Twins. Luckily, it was also one of their rare solo moves when Walter was killed in a car accident on the 21st of September 1937, leaving his brother behind to keep working on the 111 as well as other Hankel projects. Production The Luftwaffe thought it had a hit with the HE 111. It was just what they were wanting for the style of warfare that would become to be known as Blitzkrieg lightning quick attacks and fast moving campaigns with plenty of short to medium range air power supporting ground troops. There had been debate in the early days of the Luftwaffe whether to invest in heavy strategic bombers. One of the Luftwaffe's chief backers for heavy bombers was General Walter Weaver. At the time, he was the chief of staff for the Luftwaffe and he was pushing German aircraft companies to build four-engine heavies known as Ural bombers. The idea was that in the event of a war with Russia, Weaver thought that perhaps German ground forces might be able to reach Moscow in the initial offensive. However, he worried that they might get bogged down due to the vast distances involved. He wanted Germany to have long-range heavy bombers to hit the enemy's factories behind the front. However, he was killed in a tragic crash when the Henkel HE-70 Blitz that he was flying took off without the aileron gust locks removed. The idea of German heavy bombers died with him because of a poor pre-flight walk-around. And so the Luftwaffe was eventually set up to be more of a flying artillery for the Blitzkrieg style of war. There was also worry about numbers. The German aircraft industry was just being reinvented and there was concern that there just wasn't enough industrial capacity to build bigger aircraft. So they went with more mediums and smalls rather than large size. Hermann Göring himself, who was the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe, was supposed to have said, in quotes, The Führer will never ask me how big our bombers are, but how many we have. Close quotes. For the cost of two heavies, you could have three mediums, and that seemed like a pretty good bargain. And that is why the Luftwaffe went to war with the HE-111, and why the Blitzkrieg philosophy is just baked into its DNA. In order to fulfill the demand for the vast numbers of planes wanted, Henkel constructed a whole new factory at Oriensburg, starting in 1936. And by the next year, the first HE-111s began rolling off the production lines, and by the outbreak of war, 808 HE-111s had been built, and by the end of 1939, another 452 were built, giving a total of 1,260. They would continue to build between 1,300 to 1,400 aircraft per year until production ceased in the end of 1944. The H variant was the most produced and was the most definitive version of the HE-111. It included the very distinctive aerodynamic, glazed, stepless cockpit. Most previous versions had had a more conventional stepped cockpit. But from these variants on, they all had completely glazed noses with incredible visibility and an asymmetric mounting for an MG-15 machine gun. This was new to me as I began my research that the nose was actually offset. This kept the gunner out of the way of the pilot's visibility but a vertical wire had to be installed in the nose to act as a lubber line to show the pilot actually where the front of the airplane was. Five HE-111 Geschwader, or wings, were deployed for the invasion of Poland. Formations of the aircraft participated in some battles where ground forces were cut off, surrounded, and then virtually destroyed by aerial assault. During the Phony War, HE-111s were sent to do damage to the Royal Navy. The home fleet at Scapa Flow and the Firth of Forth were attacked as well as British port depots, storage facilities for oil and grain facilities. Mines were also dropped on British sea lanes and direct attacks on British merchant shipping were performed. During the Battle of Norway, 
HE-111s pounded targets and were meant to offset the British naval superiority in the North Sea. They also performed anti-shipping duties to prevent Allies from sending reinforcements. HE-111s pounded Rotterdam during the invasion of France and the Low Countries with over 100 tons of bombs. They also supported the dash to the English Channel, helping defeat the French forces at Sedan, the Allied counteroffensive at the Battle of Arras, and assisted German siege forces during the Battle of Dunkirk. They cut off the French forces by attacking the French rail network and preventing reinforcements or retreat. Although the Luftwaffe had initially thought that the 111 was going to be too fast for fighters to catch, the demands of war proved this otherwise. The original plane had been designed with three MG-15s, but this number was beefed up to sometimes seven, with guns added in the waist and the dustbin ventral turret being replaced by a bathtub turret. During the Battle of Britain, the bomb load was also beginning to be found lacking as the HE-111 was being asked to do the job of a strategic bomber. Because the racks blocked the operation of the bomb bay doors, fuel cells were placed in the bomb bay instead. Barrage balloon cable cutting equipment was added to some aircraft. Although the HE-111 was known as a tough bird that could take a lot of punishment, the meat grinder of the Battle of Britain was hell on the bomber formations. With most of the crew members clustered in the nose, a head-on burst there was deadly. More armor was added. However, even with this, and the more guns, the decision was made to switch to night attacks during what the Brits called the Blitz. New radio navigation gear was installed to help the bombers find the targets in the night. However, the losses during this battle just could not be sustained. It is thought that 756 HE-111s were lost during the Battle of Britain. However, the HE-111 soldiered on, going everywhere the fighting went, doing many things that they had never been planned for this bomber. They were modified to carry torpedoes in the Battle of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Sea, and fought as far north as the Arctic Circle, interdicting Arctic convoys heading towards the Soviet Union. They fought in the Balkans, the Middle East, North Africa, and the Mediterranean. During Barbarossa, they were employed as train busters, ranging far ahead of the Stukas, although the losses were becoming prohibitive. They bombed enemy pockets of resistance, and when necessary, were turned into transport aircraft to supply the army and bring out the wounded when the Germans found themselves to be surrounded. They were heavily involved in Stalingrad and lost 165 aircraft who were trying to supply the encircled 6th Army. They were employed in strategic bombing operations against German arms factories, at first during the day, but then again switching to night when the losses became too much. Perhaps one of their greatest successes came on the 21st of June 1944. The U.S. Army Air Forces had started something known as shuttle missions to the Soviet Union. They would depart from their bases in the U.K., attack their targets in Germany, and then continue on to land at bases in Russia. After refueling and rearming, the next day they would fly back, hitting targets again on the way out. On the 21st of June, HE-111s caught the formations of U.S. bombers and fighters on the ground without sufficient protection and dumped 100 tons of bombs on them, destroying 44 B-17s and 15 fighters, causing the whole shuttle bombing program to be cancelled after that. In 1943, however, the HE-111 was being withdrawn from frontline service as faster and more powerful aircraft such as the Junkers Ju-88 and Dornier Do-217 took over. But also, offensive operations were also winding down as the Luftwaffe lost air supremacy. However, the HE-111s kept soldiering on, often being asked to carry experimental weapons such as glider-mounted torpedoes and rocket-assisted glide bombs against shipping. Once the V-1 sites were overrun by Allied armies, the HE-111s and their crews were tasked with flying V-1 flying bombs under their wings. It was a crazy hazardous mission. Flying across the North Sea at night, the HE-111s had to stay at wave height to avoid radar and Allied night fighters. Then, at the predetermined release point, 
they would have to pop up to 1500 feet, release the flying bomb, and then dive back down for the long, long return home. Even if they got back to their home base, they were just as likely to get bounced by a British mosquito when they tried to land. At the very end of the war, HE-111s reverted to transports, helping to evacuate German forces home. However, they were also used to attack the bridges over the Oder River to try and slow the Soviet advance as it pressed on to Berlin. After the war, Dr. Henkel described the HE-111 as a reliable, proven, and easily maintained worker bee for the Luftwaffe bomber units. Even though after 1944 they had been technically superseded and, above all, were hampered by their lack of range and, despite repeated modifications, could not be given the additional range required, there was really no substitute for them. But the HE-111 didn't just do the regular duties that you would expect. But the HE-111 didn't just do the regular duties that you would expect. In addition to day and night bombing operations and cargo and passenger hauling duties, I've already mentioned that some carried torpedoes and surface-to-air missiles such as the V-1 and guided bombs and glide bombs. Some were designated as pathfinders with additional radio equipment installed. There was a version built specifically with a jump hatch for carrying 16 paratroopers. Some were able to tow gliders, such as the DFS-230 glider, which was able to carry 9 troops or 2,600 pounds of cargo, and the Gotha GO-242, which could carry 20 troops or the equivalent weight of equipment. However, to tow the massive Messerschmitt ME-321 gigant glider required more than one tug. Initially, it was hauled into the sky by a system known as Troika Schlepp, which meant three twin-engine aircraft tied together and pulling one massive glider. Frankly, it's a great word, but a terrible and dangerous way to tow a glider. Ernst Henkel was tasked with coming up with a better way. His solution was the Henkel HE-111Z Zwilling, which means twins. They started with two regular H6s and then added a special center wing structure containing a fifth engine. Duties were divided between the two halves of the ship. The left fuselage had the main pilot, main mechanic, a gunner, and a radio operator slash navigator, while the right side had the co-pilot, secondary mechanic, and another gunner. The pilot's control panel had full instrumentation while the co-pilot only had the basics, and supposedly the pilot only had throttle levers for control over the five engines, while controls for the radiator flaps were divided between both cockpits. Landing gear could be raised or lowered by either cockpit. It does seem strange that both sides didn't have full instruments and full controls, but maybe it was too complicated to accomplish in a time frame. I know that initially the F-82 twin Mustang had fully functioning cockpits so that either pilot could fly and that control could be passed back and forth to help ease fatigue on extremely long range flights. However, the later night fighter version of the F-82 had the left side being the pilot with instruments and controls and the right side was a radar operator. I guess if you think of the ship as two airplanes joined together, then it's strange that both pilots can't fly. However, if you think of the ship as one plane, well, then it's not so weird. Even with the five engines, the HE-111Z still did not have enough power to pull a fully loaded ME-321 airborne. And so some of these aircraft had rocket pods installed for extra thrust to take off. These rocket pods would be fired to help with takeoff and then would be dropped by parachute after the tug and glider were airborne. The HE-111Z could tow a Gotha GO-242 or Messerschmitt ME-321 Gigant glider up to 10 hours at cruising speed. Henkel built 12 Zwillings and 8 were destroyed either in the air or on the ground before the end of the war. There were plans to produce Zwilling long-range bombers and long-range reconnaissance aircraft, but these plans never moved forward. For an aircraft that was basically obsolete and had ceased production before the end of the war, it's remarkable that variants of the 111 continued in service until even the 1970s. These were the CASA 2.111s built in Spain. Basically, if you recall, 
During the Spanish Civil War, the Spanish nationalists received HE-111Bs and later HE-111Es from Germany. Afterwards, it was decided that Spain needed more, so they negotiated with Henkel in order to build 200 under license. Casa Constructones Aeronauticas SA got to work, and by the time they were done, they had built over 230 of these aircraft that at least from the outside looked just like the original 111s. Obtaining engines was always a problem during the war years because Germany was loath to supply any as they needed all they could build. CASA had to scrounge around Europe looking for Jumo 211 engines and were even forced to cannibalize engines from other aircraft to make do. The situation wasn't improved until well after the war when Spain was able to obtain and use Rolls-Royce Merlin 500 engines. These aircraft were used as bombers and reconnaissance aircraft, and there was a nine-passenger transport version. If you want to see any of these CASA 2.111s in action, you can check out the excellent films Battle of Britain and Patton, because the aircraft portrayed there as HE-111s are actually the Spanish versions. So, whatever happened to the Gunter twin that wasn't killed in a car crash in 1937? I know you've all been sitting on the edge of your seats wondering what happened to him. After the Second World War, Siegfried took a serious prestige cut from designing and working on the most advanced aircraft in the world to eking out a living with his father-in-law in his Berlin garage. He tried to get asylum with the Allies, offering them his talents, but he was rebuffed, which obliged him to then turn to the Soviets in 1948. He worked in the Soviet Union until 1954, when he returned to East Germany and eventually to West Germany in 1957, where he got his job back at Henkel, and he died on the 20th of June, 1969. But what about Dr. Henkel? After the defeat of Germany, Henkel was again barred from building airplanes, and so to pay the bills, Henkel pivoted his company to build something a little less prestigious, but maybe something more useful in post-war Germany. Scooters and mopeds. Also, like the post-war Messerschmitt company, Henkel built cute little um, automobiles. The Henkel version being called the cabine bubble car. Eventually the ban on building aircraft was lifted and Henkel again started making flying machines. This time, the F-104 Starfighter under license for the West German Luftwaffe. At that time, they stopped making the bubble cars and mopeds, but they kept making scooters right up until 1965. Ernst Henkel died in 1958 in Stuttgart and was inducted to the International Air and Space Hall of Fame at the San Diego Air and Space Museum in 1981. His company went through a series of mergers that end up being Airbus. Pilots and Survivors There are several HE-111s available for viewing in the world. There's an HE-111E1 on display at the Museo del Air, Madrid, Spain. And there is an HE-111P2 at the Royal Norwegian Air Force Museum at Gardermoen. The Deutsche Museum has a Heinkel HE-111 Casa 2-111B on display. The Kent Battle of Britain Museum is restoring an example that was built as an HE-111H-16 and later converted to a CASA 2-111B. There's a YouTube video out there that shows the last flying HE-111, which was November 72615, also a CASA, owned by the American Air Power Heritage Flying Museum. However, this video is from back in 1997 and I'm sad to report that this aircraft crashed while landing on the 10th of July 2003 with the loss of both occupants. The cause was determined to be an engine failure. However, my favorite story of an HE-111 survivor is that of serial number 701152, an H-20 troop carrying version built in 1944. As a troop carrier, it had seats and straps installed for 16 paratroopers. As Germany wasn't involved in too many offensive operations during this stage of the war, it seems more likely that it was used for dropping secret agents behind enemy lines. Anyway, at the end of the war, it was captured by U.S. forces and lucky enough to be booked on a transport ship for a cruise across the Atlantic to America as part of an evaluation of captured enemy equipment. 
However, it seemed like this aircraft's luck had run out when it arrived at Cherbourg, and the ship that was to take it to America was full, and so the plane was left behind. However, the aircraft got lucky again when three American airmen took an interest in the abandoned aircraft. The airmen were Major Carter, Major Williamson, and Captain Ordway, who were P-47 pilots of the 56th Fighter Group. They weren't just any airmen. Williamson was an ace credited with 13 aerial kills, including five on one day. For that feat, he had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Captain James Carter had the distinction to have flown the very first unpainted silver P-47, named, fittingly, Silver Lady. He also had gotten six kills. So here they were, still on the continent, and here was this free ex Luftwaffe plane just sitting there, and they decided, why the hell not? Let's bring it back to our home airfield in Boxted, Essex. So even though they were all fighter jocks, and not all that familiar with flying bombers, and not at all familiar with flying German aircraft, without any checkout or anything, they fired it up and took off. They actually had to go around a few times before landing, because they didn't know how to get the gear down. Flying in the Luftwaffe's livery just wouldn't do, so they had their pet plane painted in the 56th Fighter Group colors, matte purple and black with red on the nose and rudder. On one side of the fuselage, they painted stylized identification numbers, a letter O surrounded, a letter C, and letter W, the initials of Ordway, Carter, and Williamson. For several weeks, they flew the aircraft here and there, and it was all fun and games until September 1945, when they were ordered back to the States. Now, they knew they couldn't bring it home, and they also worried if they left it behind, they might get into trouble if people from another unit came along and found that they had been possessing and operating an aircraft without documentation, as the Henkel was most definitely not on the USAAF's books. The last thing they wanted after surviving a shooting war was to get in trouble over paperwork. So what do you do with an airplane that you're not supposed to have? It was too big to cut up and dispose of, and besides, they'd gotten somewhat attached to their liberated pet plane. They couldn't bring it to another U.S. base for the same reason they couldn't leave it behind. So, like parents unable to support a baby, dropping it off at the door of a church they decided to drop off their Henkel with the RAF. Not a major base where things would be, you know, more tight, but at a quiet base where there would be less hassle. So on the 12th of September, 1945, Carter took off from Boxted for the last time with the 111 and flew it to RAF North Weald, followed by another pilot flying one of the 56 transport planes. Carter landed, parked the 111 by the tower, shut down, and then hopped in the waiting transport and was gone. Before the RAF could blame anyone, Carter and his unit were on their way back to the States. So this 111 went on display at several RAF stations, and its interior was used for shooting the Battle of Britain film. Ever since 1978, it has lived at the RAF Museum in London. I'd like to give credit to the rafmuseum.org.uk article, how an American Saved Our German Henkel HE-111 by Chris Hendricks for this story. I actually started researching this episode without knowing much about the HE-111 and without being all that excited about it. I was doing it after all, if you remember, as a request. However, just by studying this one aircraft, I've learned a great deal about the rise and fall of the Luftwaffe and have really come to appreciate this iconic aircraft that really should have been retired mid-war, but just like the Energizer Bunny, just kept on going and going and going. There are pictures of what has been described today on the World of Warbirds Facebook page. And if, you've, if you like what you've heard today, give us a good review and share with your friends. Thanks. If you get some joy out of listening, please consider supporting the podcast by making a modest donation via PayPal. My PayPal address is at WOWB17. That's at World of Warbird 17, or if you want to remember it this way, at WowB17. You'll have my eternal gratitude.